So the uh, Facebook story is kind of well known in some respects. The three senior officers, the CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, is you know, the subject of a great strange movie. Uh, he's a global player in uh, philanthropy as well as business. Uh, everybody watches him. Chief Operating Officer, uh, Sheryl Sandberg, in their spare time, wrote a, a bestseller and stands out there as an inspiration and guide and advocate for women in business. And then uh, the Chief Product Officer is, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Chris so Cox. Happy to so, be here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give us your story a little bit, just in brief. Let's find out who you are and what you're doing here. Sure. I, um, so I came to Facebook in 2005. I was a graduate student at Stanford studying AI. Hmm. And Mark and Dustin and Chris Hughes, the Facebook founders, had just moved out to Palo Alto, right. where they were busily um, working on getting people to drop out of Stanford to join their engineering team. So they're talking <laughs> to a lot of people besides you at this point. Yeah, they were. I mean, they, they knew that there were good software engineers at Stanford. I'm just curious, how does that kind of trolling actually work? Are they showing up on... There on are posters on the, in the Gates Computer Science Building. They're yeah. hanging around. Uh -huh. They're um, using the network of people that they've already hired right. to try and just ask, who are the good engineers? Uh -huh. Who do you know that's great? Can you get them to come in and talk to us? Okay. Um, so I was one of those people. I was working on um, natural language processing, which is right. trying to help computers understand speech. Mm -hmm. And I went in to meet Mark. I had read about him in the Stanford Daily, which was about the most prestigious paper you could read about him in then. <laughs> and um, Mark wasn't there. It was 11 AM. He hadn't arrived yet. Um, Justin Timberlake was not there either, by the way. <laughs> Um, the movie did not actually resemble in any way <laughs> what the office looked like. But I met Dustin, who is uh, Dustin Moskovitz, who is the head of engineering. Mm -hmm. His job was to build the engineering team, and I immediately liked him. Mm. Um, he was humble, he was smart, he was very driven. They wanted you to do AI or something else? They wanted me to help build what they called Feed, mm -hmm. which was their vision for the homepage, which at the time just said, welcome back. Mm -hmm. uh, because Facebook began as a directory. There were five million American college students on it. And they had a vision that this could be the seed of a, of a larger directory that was collaboratively built. Okay. Um, and that there was a powerful dynamic among the early population, which is they were themselves. Mm -hmm. And they were you know, starting to do the things that you think about when you think about Facebook today. Sharing photos at the time, if you remember, the ancient prehistory of 2005 required a scanner. Right. You were asked to put a photograph of yourself on, and nobody had ever put a photograph on the internet. I mean, if you think about it, what occasion would you ever have in 2005 unless you were selling something on eBay? Right. Which most people weren't. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he painted that picture, and then he painted this picture of turning it into a, um, a service where you could see what was going on and share what was going on, and he asked me how I would build that, and I drew on the whiteboard, and we liked each other, and I ended up joining the company. So that was... How, was, how did that go over at Stanford? It mixed. I got mixed <laughs> advice. Uh, it's 2005, startups were not mm -hmm. well regarded. Wow. Um, there, we, it was still the hangover period. And how far along were you in your degree? I was, had just started a graduate program. Not even master's yet. It was a master's program, program, yeah. Um, and I had like my advisor, I had my team, I had my project, I'd started working on it. A little it. bit of funding. Uh, a like little that. bit, yeah. Um, Meanwhile, they were offering you a significant salary. It wasn't that significant at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there's upside. There was upside and there was just a, contrad there was a massive contradiction. I mean, most people at that time thought mm -hmm. the whole idea of being online and, and saying this is who I am was a joke. <gasps> Wow. As you, okay. as I'm sure you remember. Okay, so it's a classic call to adventure in the sense that this is a, a big, strange jump that you're supposed to make. Yeah. You made it. I did. And I, I feel very, very lucky because I could have flipped a coin on the wrong day and made the other way. So uh, briefly, I mean, you rose within the ranks, clearly. Uh, through what? What was the sequence of events that got you to Chief Product Officer? Um, so I worked on a bunch of the first versions of 
what the Facebook product is now, except back then it was just a website. Mm -hmm. We used to complain about having to build for more than one browser, <laughs> right. uh, which is so funny. Um, and then I just sort of, you know, I worked on Newsfeed, I worked on uh, the messaging system, I worked on a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. For a brief period, I ran. As an engineer or as a? As an engineer. We didn't have any product managers for a while. Wow. I say with no, with no irony that I now run the product management team. <laughs> um, so you're coding? Yeah, I was just writing code. I mean, that's what, wow. that was my background. Facebook at that time was, you know, 20 engineers who were mm -hmm. all wearing lots of different hats. And, you know, moving along at our own pace. Uh -huh. Then what happened? I briefly ran HR and recruiting, uh, which, was a, which was a, you know, I never in a million years, if I never in a million years thought I'd work at the Facebook, I never in a million years dreamed I'd do that. But Mark asked me to do it after we'd had several people come in and it just didn't really work out. Uh -huh. We were at around 150 people, and when a company passes Dunbar's number, all this weird stuff starts to happen. Remind us what Dunbar's number is. 150 people is a, a size of a tribe after which you need structure to deal with communication. Right. It's very important in anybody working on social products to understand. A message thread, for example, after there's 150 people in it, starts to creak right. under the weight of the, just this. It's one of these magic numbers and group sizes. And I've talked to so many startup uh, CEOs who, like, as soon as they pass this number, mm. all this weird stuff starts to happen. Yeah. And the weird stuff means the company needs a little more structure to deal with communication, decision making, mm. stuff like that. And so, for briefly, I, I took on the role of just you know figuring out who and how we want to hire, mm -hmm. who, how we want to articulate our values and our narrative, the mission of the company, stuff like that. How we want to do internal communication. So this is classic corporate culture building. It's really. organizational yeah. sort of uh, structure. OK, then what? Then I moved to take on the role of head of product, which was the role of running the product management team and the design team. So and product means what? So the product is software mm -hmm. and the user experience. So if you think about uh, Facebook has messaging, it has photo uploading, it has mm -hmm. video, it has news feed, it has the profile has search, it has all these different things which each need to have um, a definition for what is the problem it's solving in the world. Mm -hmm. And then a nice. strategy and a roadmap and a plan for doing well mm -hmm. on you know, an Android device in rural India right. as well as it's doing on an iPhone 6 in San Francisco. So does product also sort of include the customers or is that a separate answer? It's understanding the customers, the responsibility of the product manager, defining who the customer is and which problem is being solved for them. Okay, so you went f well beyond Dunbar's number in terms of the organization, yeah, well beyond it's, it's five point past million that. in terms of <laughs> users. What are the current numbers with Facebook? So Facebook's at around 1.6 billion people okay. are active users of Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, there's about, there's one billion people using WhatsApp there's 900 million people using Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. There's 500 million people using Instagram. Mm -hmm. And um, virtual reality, which is our next product line, is still early days. Uh, but we're starting to see some pretty cool um, new stuff as mm -hmm. the Gear VR, which is the mobile, the Samsung partnership. You've probably seen TV commercials for it. You can slap your phone into a white pair of goggles. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see that um, sort of come alive. And where are these one point something billion? They're basically all over the world, minus China, North Korea, and Iran, where we're blocked. Um, increasingly, we look at, you know, the really interesting thing for us right now is the people who are joining Facebook are, you know, the average new user will be um, in Delhi on a Moto E, which is a phone you probably haven't seen or used in five or six years, maybe more, on a 2G network which most of us probably haven't used in a while. Mm -hmm. They'll be going on and off of 2G and Wi-Fi throughout the day, which mm. means they're going to want to like queue up articles and videos that they can watch when they're at school or at their workplace or at an internet cafe. Mm. Um, for many, it will be their first computer and their first camera and their first internet connection. Wow. Will all happen in one purchase. Mm -hmm. It will be 
um, assisted by the person who's selling you the phone, who's sort of like the genius bar of the sort of developing world, is the people selling handsets. And they'll help them get set up, and the person will be asking, help me get set up with WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram. And they'll have seen their friends use it. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which they'll use it will be ingenious compared to the ways that you or I probably use these things. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at, in emerging markets, how is Facebook being used? Mm -hmm. And that is the basis for a lot of our roadmaps. So we discovered in Indonesia, huge country, very, very, very um, fast adoption of internet, smartphones, and Facebook. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Indonesia? Well, we discover that there's a huge amount of buying and selling. There's these giant groups. One group is for auto parts. Mm. One group is for used children's clothes. You know, one group is for food staples, OK? And each of these groups has tens of thousands of people in it. They're heavily moderated, because there's a lot of activity, so you need a moderator who is setting the rules. Here are the rules for how things get listed. Here's how I take things down. Here's how you can sign up, et cetera. Remember, don't list twice, all this other stuff. It's like old school internet forums. Yeah, so this is some kind of self-appointed manager of a market. Yes, online. and it's rampant, and it's awesome. And you talk to these people, and they're like, this is by far the most important thing I need the internet for. Yeah. Wow. You know, I have a four-year-old. I need to find some, you know, and if you have a young child, you know you need to get clothes every, like, two weeks. <laughs> Uh, I take it you have a young child. I have a two-year-old, and it's right. like, where, what do we do with these clothes now? And how do we get the next level up? Right. Um, and just because there's not you know, eBay and Craigslist and the, the tools that we have here that we've taken for granted just don't exist there. Mm -hmm. and so when they see Facebook, they put into it what they want it for, what mm -hmm. they want to use it for. So we have this whole roadmap to build better marketplace tools, price listing, you know, structured search, product tagging, all this other stuff to make Facebook useful for Indonesians in the way that they want it to. Do you have people on the ground doing this and studying this, or it's all happening? It's a combination. So we'll have teams there. We'll send our product managers and researchers there. Mm. We're trying to have these guys be literate mm -hmm. in the emerging behavior of internet usage all around the world, especially in the, pe the parts of the world that are coming online really quickly. Mm. India is growing 40% year over year its internet adoption, which is insane. Oh my God. One third of the next billion internet users are going to come from India. One in three. And using what languages? 22 different official languages. <laughs> and there's, 40, there's at least another 20 if you include that. Mm -hmm. And a, a very interesting thing there is how languages are kind of, you need transla good translation tools. So you want to build good translation tools that auto translate if you're a uh, you know, using Hindi and I'm using Punjabi, you want to have a good translation across the wire. Hmm. The other thing we realized that we were doing wrong is building a good transliteration tool um, when you're typing. So if you're uh, using a phone, you're, let's pretend you have a Moto E and you want to post an update, mm -hmm. watching Stuart Brand at the Aspen Ideas Festival, and you want to type it in Hindi using the Sanskrit, you know, uh, characters, it takes a long time. So what we discovered that Hindi uh, speakers want is they want to use the English transliteration. So you type the, the, the version in Roman characters. My word. It sounds like the Hindi, but then have it immediately flip into Hindi in the way that it appears to your friends. Wow. Until we figured that out, mm -hmm. we were like, why aren't people posting as much in India? What's going on? And it's not some like deep existential thing. It's just a very tactical, simple friction. Mm -hmm that if you can find it and remove it, suddenly people can start using Facebook or, or WhatsApp or whatever it is in the way that it was intended. So that's part of a service that they get from using Facebook. Yeah, if you're an Indian user and you have Hindi as your language, you'll get offered, you know, mm. when you open your, your, your box to start typing, we'll say, hey, we just built this. And they were like, thank you. <laughs> Takes forever. <laughs> I wonder what the sort of second order effects of that are culturally to have that kind of language uh, fungibility out there? Does that make the cultures more comfortable with each other and less tribal, or is that just pure wishful liberal thinking? You know, I'm not an expert in, in the relationship between mm -hmm. language and sense of connectedness. Mm -hmm. But we do see, I mean, as a practical matter, we just see a huge amount of latent demand for access. 
Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, Myanmar is another amazing example because you know, they've just elected their first democratically elected government, very liberal in terms of wanting to build infrastructure for technology in the country of Myanmar. Um, actually, The Atlantic did an amazing piece. Craig Maud wrote it. It was called The Facebook-Loving Farmers of Myanmar. Hey. Have, has anyone here read that piece? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome piece. Yeah, it's very, it was really very good. It was one of the best pieces of research that we could possibly have done by you know, Craig Maud. Um, so he was just kind of like, I want to go see what's going on in Myanmar. Huge change happening there. Mm. I just want to go look around and see what people are doing. He discovered that everybody had just gotten their first phone. And everybody had just gotten onto the internet. And they were living. He was, he was sending me messages. Craig is a friend. And he was sending me like screenshots and messages of, with his disbelief at how much they were using Facebook. But it so was going they're going straight to smartphone, not through the cell he's phone complete stage. Complete PC leapfrog. Wow. Never had a PC, never wanted a PC, just like never entered their consciousness for most mm -hmm. Burmese. And here they are, and they're not using Facebook to connect with their friends and family. If you look over the shoulders of most people, it's like, what's going on with my friends from high school mm -hmm. or my college acquaintances or this you know, guy I used to work with, what's going on with them, I scroll through, I leave a couple comments and I move on. Here they were using it as a way of finding and sharing news. Local news, national news, hmm. um, and, and, and their rationale for it is that there's just not a good news infrastructure in, in Myanmar for reasons you all probably know better than I do. Hmm. And here they had a tool for sort hmm. of finding and discussing current events, and they valued it immensely. So and it's a, a young, tech-oriented government. How does that help things? Well, they're starting to do digital money. You know, they're starting to look at things that we know. And for, if you look at Tanzania as a forward-leaning example mm -hmm. of a country in, in, the, in the developing world that has really embraced the role that mobile phones can play in helping them grant, give people access to financial services, to health care, um, to education eventually. Mm -hmm. Some countries embrace that and some don't. And when the government wants to help move things along, it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know some of the, some of the folks in, the, in the, the higher ups in the, in the government there are looking at Tanzania as a model and I think that's fantastic. So I think one of the things that often surprises Westerners is they go to like a, you know, a smartphone market in India or something like that, and what do they see there? It's amazing. I mean, I was there in uh, January with Jesse here. We were in Gafar Market. So Gafar Market is in Delhi. <clears throat> it's the largest unauthorized electronics dealer in India, <laughs> which means <laughs> it's probably the place. We were trying to do the math. Is this the place which is ground zero on Earth for the smartphone revolution? Hmm. If you were to just say, where is the place where the most people are crossing the threshold e each day? And remember, getting your first smartphone and your first internet, first video camera, access to the internet, access to the Library of Congress and YouTube, and like, imagine getting all of that at once. Wow. For us, we've gotten that stuff gradually over the course of the last 15 or 20 years. Oh, cool, now I have a 10 megapixel camera on my phone. Mm -hmm. Now I have a gyroscope. I have a GPS device in here. These things, I think we've sort of gotten used to the fact that suddenly we're carrying around like a really nice high resolution screen. Mm -hmm. A computer that's 10,000 times faster than the one mm -hmm. you know, that we, were, we had on our desks in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And for somebody to get all of that in one instant is insane. And I think that Gafar Market might be the place <laughs> where that's happening. So you go in and you talk to the, first of all, if ever uh, you get a chance to go to Delhi, you have to go to this place. It is insane. And in a good way, I mean, the energy, the entrepreneurial What's energy. What size, you know, just a couple blocks? Or uh, what are we yeah, talking? imagine four to five blocks, densely packed. Um, Wires hanging everywhere, shoulder to shoulder, and tons and tons and tons and tons of stores selling either phones or all of the stuff that goes along with phones, power cords, um, you know, casings, you know, you name it, selfie sticks, the whole nine yards of the mobile revolution 
How much does it cost to cross this line into this revolution for somebody who shows up? So no. it's okay, I want to get a smartphone. I think and about $40. $40. Um, but it, it'll depend on the device and it'll depend on what's coming along with it. Mm. But data plans, they're a la carte. So every, you know, mm -hmm. get outside of the US, the whole, the whole e economics of getting onto the internet are different. And so there's a huge question mark in the person buying the phone's head of how do I get this they don't say, I want 10 megabytes. They say, I want WhatsApp. <laughs> um, because that's the experience that they're having. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we've invested, we're starting to invest more and more and more in figuring out how to lower, to make Facebook highly data efficient. So building switches for data on, like data efficient on, data efficient off. Mm. Because when you're in an internet cafe, you want video. All right. You want, you want the whole nine yards. You want live video. You don't want live video to show up in your newsfeed if you're kind of mm -hmm. roaming and you're on 2G because it might literally consume your whole wallet. Mm -hmm. And so the more we understand that, the more we realize, man, like the product literally needs to have as a core part of it what kind of data mode are you on. Mm -hmm. And people are just incredibly sensitive and sophisticated about knowing where they are. We'll say more about the sophisticated. These sound like pretty resourceful customers. Uh, is that the kind of customers you want? Yeah, I mean, my friend Jared always used to say, my friend Jared Cohen, uh, who many of you know, he wrote the book, uh, The New Digital Age, uh, with Eric Schmidt. Mm -hmm. um, he, in 2007, I remember, he had just spent a year traveling the Middle East. <clears throat> this is a, a, a young Jewish kid from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. wandering, <laughs> you know, Lebanon, Iraq, um, just like going all around. And he came back and he said, um, this was right as we began to translate Facebook in 2006. We were just starting to release it in other countries. And we had just released a, a translation in Arabic, um, which is difficult because it's a right to left language. Oh, Lord. So you're not just getting the characters right, you need to have the UI be able to mirror itself and flip itself and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, these young, you know, the Middle East is the youngest region in the world. You have tons and tons and tons and tons of young people. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Wow. And Just young it, people is your raw meat, I guess. I would never, I mean, I don't think, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he would say these people understand the rules and how to use your product more than any American. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's so important to them mm -hmm. that they know exactly how to get the privacy control to be exactly right, to you know, keep it just to the people that they want to see it, which is the other, the other young people. Uh -huh. um, and it's just to me a reminder that when, when the product is something that's really a deep, a deep part of whatever you're trying to do, which for a lot of them was political organizing, mm -hmm. you know the rules. Hmm. So the... The great thing about the social media is the sense I get that uh, what's on there really is the customers. Um, it's their world. And you guys are, you know, much like the phone company back in the day, you're selling it the customers to each other. <laughs> and, but you're not only selling them to each other, you're, you're learning from them what they want and how you can help them get what they want or create what they want. How does that play out? Yeah. Both, you know, like here and in these developing Markets. Yeah, it's funny. We, the basic, the basic science for how we figure out what to build is we do careful research. It's sort of like anthropology. Mm. You just watch mm -hmm. how the product is being used or misused, and usually in its misuse, you find what you need to go build. And you watch that from what's going on online or uh, on the ground, or yeah, um, in 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 the experience. So mm -hmm. going back to you know when I started at the company. We had just released the groups feature because people were creating profiles for groups. So it's like, hey, I'm on the soccer team. I want, it's like now that everyone's here, mm -hmm. I want our soccer team to have a group. Right. And if, <clears throat> so that was the sort of realization that had us build the groups feature. Then people start trying to put, create groups for an event. So, hey, we have a big birthday party coming up. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have a start date and an end date, and we didn't have RSVPs, the whole feature set of what you need for an event. So that was the um, sort of beginnings of, of events. Even with live, this, this thing that we weren't, 
we didn't like go up on the mountain and decide that live is going to be so important. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like this lightning bolt. We released live just for public figures. We have an app called Mentions, which is for like the president mm -hmm. or you know people who are professional public figures. A lot of journalists use it. A lot of um, you know, it's like, what does Rihanna use when she wants to interact with her fans on Facebook? She needs a separate app because she has a lot more activity than you or I. Mm. Um, and so we built live in that app. Mm -hmm. And we just saw this explosion of awesome, really cool new stuff happening. Mm -hmm. um, starting with, I remember the first time this astronaut, who Steve Parasinski is his name, and when Scott Kelly returned from space, Steve Parzinski was this, he's like a really good doctor who's also been in space a lot. Mm -hmm. So he is like one of the, he's clearly the designated expert on what happens to your body when you're in space for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there turns out there are tens of thousands of people who are really interested in that. <laughs> what happens, to, does it get bigger? What happens to your diaphragm? What mm -hmm. happens to, like all these biological questions related to being in space where there are some micro niche community that is fascinated. Mm -hmm. He goes live to do a live Q&A, not quite knowing what was going to happen, and suddenly thousands of people show up and ask him these nuanced questions, mm -hmm. which to him was a total delight. Oh, yeah. Because he, you know, he's like, when I'm having coffee, I'm not going to be able to go deep with somebody on like cellular elongation. Mm -hmm. But here they are. And so we saw that beginning to happen, and we said, cool, this should probably be in the main app. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of what be became this big push we've done around live. And it, it came out of just seeing how much latent demand there was for something that was that raw. <clears throat> and that's really how we just figure out what to do. So the, an, an interesting question I suspect abides from back in the 80s when we were doing you know, bulletin boards in the well and stuff like that is these online communities form or fail you to form. You guys know that Stuart Brand created one, if not the first, one of the very first online communities. A thing called The Well. Yeah. But actually, we were, you know. The first Facebook. We, <laughs> <laughs> we, were, uh, we were competing with CompuServe and the source and some other things, and, and we figured out some things that they didn't. Uh, among other things, uh, you'll appreciate this, there was uh, a conference that turned up on CompuServe where people wanted to discuss CompuServe and the various problems they mm. found with it. Mm. CompuServe took that conference. Oof. <laughs> so, you know, cold. backwards. It's not like <laughs> cold, it's insanely stupid. <laughs> you know, here's your customers trying to improve your service yeah. and you're telling them, no, please don't do that. We're in charge here. Uh, and it was, you know, it was clear that they didn't understand that their customers actually were the, the product. The, um, but the community is tricky. You have trolls, you have all these issues of sort of who's in, who's out, all kinds of stuff. How do you guys work with that? Yeah, I mean, we, it turns out that using your real name, which mm. is the, the first rule of Facebook, is you have to use your real name. And th this of, was a breakthrough, because there was a long time when anonymity, in theory, was this wonderful thing that was going to allow people to tell the truth, and, you know, there's going to be all this whistleblowing, and, and all the, you know, the, the masked crusaders could uh, get out there and crusade. And it turned out in practice to be complete horseshit. That uh, <laughs> with anonymity, people behave viciously and uh, vilely and uh, hide behind the anonymity to do terrible things. And you know, even in very sweet places like the well, when we had an anonymous conference, it went to hell so fast we shut it off within a week. Yeah. And so you guys solved that. Well, we haven't solved it, but I do think it's helped a lot. I mean, it takes away a lot of the the mask, there's a whole you know, literature on if you put a mask on or a costume on, you'll start doing a lot, you'll treat people a lot worse than if you're yourself. Bingo. And that plays out in digital places as well. We, um, we still have a team that deals with a lot of bullying, hate speech, terrorism, the bad stuff that happens, we don't allow it. We are pretty, I mean, we pretty much, you can say whatever you want on Facebook. We have a, mm -hmm. we have a value that says this is about a platform for all ideas, and we're not going to decide what ideas should, should win and what shouldn't. We're going to mm -hmm. let people decide for themselves what it is that they care about communicating and what it is that they want to connect to, and that's how we can be the best platform. Mm -hmm. With the following exceptions, mm -hmm. and that's where we have to be really, really um, vigilant. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, we've done a lot of that, and we also do a lot of work with external organizations to help make sure that we're using the latest science on what's going on in bullying, what's the right way to deal with bullying. Hmm. We have special flows for people to report those things and get connected right away with help because when somebody is about to have a really bad experience, we want to make sure that we're intervening and all that stuff. So it's one of those um, organizations we have that we, we tell them you're doing the Lord's work. I mean, this, mm -hmm. it's, to go and do that every single day mm -hmm. um, is tough, but it's, it's really important. So the anonymity issue, you, I guess, have people who are trying to work around that with multiple accounts and so on. How do you stay ahead of that? Most of it gets dealt with through reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so usually when something bad is happening, it gets reported right away. So just on Friday, I had somebody trying to impersonate me. Oh, yeah, that's... And I don't know if you got a friend request. Oh, man, that <laughs> impersonation stuff is vicious. But what's so cool about it is your friends immediately mm -hmm. notice. They nail them, right. And they, they say, this is bad, and it gets flagged, and then right. usually the person and their friends are involved in remediating it. Mm -hmm. um, and so surprisingly, it, it's not that common. So it's actually the, the sort of friend reference the aspect social graph. of Facebook yeah, that really a community, keeps essentially. it on us. Your community is the one that's going to be there when something starts going wrong, if it ever does. We also have a very, very, very um, state-of-the-art system for helping you never lose control of your account. So mm. things like two-factor authentication, things like device warnings and logins, you should turn all this stuff on. We help people turn it on. We recommend everyone turn it on is if ever anyone logs into your account from any device that is not the one that uses your MAC address if it's your PC or your device ID if it's your phone, we're going to block it and then re require confirmation from the phone that you've registered. Stuff like that goes a long way mm -hmm. and is the kind of thing that every, every um, service in the industry should aspire to mm -hmm. because that's how you protect 95% of the problems before they happen. Here, here. So you've got various capabilities and services coming on that are kind of cutting edge. Uh, your old field of artificial intelligence, how is that going to play out for you guys? I mean, everybody, it's such a huge renaissance for, for it right now, thanks to the advances in um, computing, mm -hmm. power, and uh, the whole sort of renaissance of neural networks, mm -hmm. which is an old idea. It's from the 60s. It's just like use the architecture of the brain as inspiration for how computer learning should work. So add the uh, rich data and some better algorithms, and suddenly we're in this new world. Suddenly, stuff's actually starting to work. Mm -hmm. uh, speech recognition <laughs> starting to work. Uh, if you've used the Amazon Echo, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, this is after years of talking to things and having it misinterpret you. Mm -hmm. And we don't have high tolerance for error when it's speech, because 99.99% .99 of our speech is with other people. Mm -hmm. And we're really good at dealing mm -hmm. with speech. Um, so how other, will that play out in Facebook? Well, the earliest application is helping the blind use Facebook. So you, if you're a blind user of Facebook or Instagram, a lot, you're looking at a lot of photos. First of all, you want to be connected. Mm -hmm. And second of all, there's a lot of photos. <laughs> so you want something that tells you what's in the photos so that you can read, hey, this is the post, but th this is two children playing on a beach, and there's a dog, and the dog is jumping out of the water and catching a frisbee. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I can feel connected to the person who posted that. You need AI for that. Mm -hmm. To understand what's in an image is a difficult problem. Um, and that's one early application that's awesome. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an accessibility technology. And we think that there's a lot more stuff like that. So the uh, one of the things that happened with mobile is that it's such a seemingly narrow straw into the, the yeah. universe of yeah. the web. Uh, and iPads and so on tend to be these kind of consumer devices. Uh, but now that they're cameras and sensors and so on, they seem to be more and more production devices. Where are you guys in that spectrum? Yeah, I mean, it's really cool. So just last week, um, we, two weeks ago, we launched 360 Photos. Uh, which lets you take, you know when you take a panorama? Uh, we've just made it so that if you upload one of those, you, can act, you actually get it as a full screen experience and you can explore it using your hand. So it's like the gyroscope of the phone is letting you, as if you're standing in the person's shoes who took the picture rather than seeing this thin thing. Hmm. Um, I actually should probably, this is probably a good chance to talk about this thing sitting behind you. What thing? <laughs> I so, thought that was just a stage prop or something. Yeah, so 360-degree video 
Have you guys ever seen one in VR? Yeah, there's a Does demo across the way. Oh, cool. So the first one I saw was a Cirque du Soleil production. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the Cirque du Soleil one, but you put it on, it is stunning. And it's especially stunning if it's 3D, uh, which is twice as much information, and it's really high resolution, like 8K per eye, 6K per eye. Mm. Um, and if it's really high frame rate, like you want 60 frames per second. And if you get 60 frames per second, 8K per eye, 3D, and you get um, a good stitching so that as you're moving your head around, you don't see smearing or blurring, it's remarkable. It's really, 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 really remarkable, and we think it's going to be a huge part of the way that um, even in the most intimate scenario where I'm trying to FaceTime my mom to walk, look at my two-year-old mm. as he's like stumbling around, rather than using a phone, maybe I'll have a piece of hardware that is a small version of that, mm. which would let me take it in that resolution and in full 360 to have her be able to see it either with the phone mm -hmm. or to slip it into her headset. Mm -hmm. So we, we wanted to help accelerate the, the 360 camera ecosystem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is very nascent. Um, there isn't a lot of good reference hardware out there. If you are a hardware hacker mm -hmm. and you want to build a 360 camera, it's hard. So we, it turns out we had this team who previously had worked at Adobe who were like really, 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 really good at um, dealing with lots of information coming in and building the hardware and the software to consolidate it and compress it. So we set off to build the perfect 360 3D reference camera that we could then build and then open source. Just like put the hardware specs and the software specs online. Hmm. Now it turns out it's really hard. There's seven, so this is it by the way, it's called the Facebook Surround 360. We're not selling it, we're not manufacturing it, we're just publishing how we did it. Um, and I actually, can you guys pull up some of the footage? Okay. So this is actually a wraparound thing on our roof in Menlo Park. This, the team had to keep going up here, going up and down and up and down and up and down. And it's crazy hard because with these camera lenses, they're each taking a, like a full stream of video. And if you just take that and you put it in, they all have slightly different color. So you need to do color correction. Now, color correct, most color correction happens in an editing room. But you need to have the color correction happen higher up in the stack. Also, if our first version was plastic. The problem with plastic is it warps because with this many cameras and then all the computers you need behind them, it gets really hot. And no amount of fans you put in there will deal with the heat. Right. So they started to literally warp like a millimeter. <laughs> the problem with warping a millimeter is it will just create uh, an, an artifact in the image. Right. So it's like it needs to be made out of this. And what basically the team was doing was taking a lot of the things that would normally happen in an editing room mm -hmm. and putting them in software using AI techniques to take an image and try and get it to where it can dump it onto memory and then onto disk in an efficient enough way that what you have on disk is high quality. Mm -hmm. Color looks good, no smearing, no blurring, no warping. Um, and it's pretty sweet. So this was the first time we got a good, like a good one. This was it. Mm -hmm. You can see the team like walking around. Very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and then we actually sent it to Grand Central Station. Mm -hmm. Because we wanted to try and just paint the picture for ourselves of how now, if you're in a headset, this is so cool because you can, it's like when you're in Grand Central Station, what you're really doing is just seeing all the little different storylines happening. And there's so many storylines happening in Grand Central Station. Right. We couldn't think of a place with more yeah. current storylines. That's great. Um, and there's coming and going, there's reunion, there's like, it's great. There's somebody, you know. Can you look at something and sort of zoom toward it? Yeah, you can watch this thing 25 times in a row. Hmm. And also, the ceiling of Grand Central Station is beautiful. Hmm. I don't know if you remember, but so you it's get rewarded gorgeous. for looking up. Yeah, you can look up. The floors are great, um, and then you can watch it 20 or 25 times, and it's just a really wonderful experience. And it makes you, it helps you appreciate hmm. that putting these cameras in places that you want to be there, 
we just sent one to um, the Oracle Arena. Any Warriors fans here? <laughs> cool. So you know how Steph Curry comes out and he, he sits, like before he comes onto the court, he hangs out in that little alleyway and he shoots, he shoots baskets from like 70 feet away. Right. And we got this camera there. And it's just so. So you can watch the ball from his hand. Yeah, it's like you can tell you're reaching into something that's going to be real. Uh -huh. um, so we're pretty excited about this. All the way up on the broad, like if you're a, a journalist and you want to take something that's small around or you're an entertainer, all the way down to you know, FaceTime with your mom. So Kevin Kelly did a nice cover story in Wired a couple months ago on VR, where he basically was converted by what he saw at Magic Leap in various mm. places, and said that uh, unlike any other medium he'd experienced, this is an experience medium. Yep. It's, it's something you, uh, you're there, and you, it's as if you were there. Yeah. On the other hand, um, Chris Anderson, former editor of Wired, uh, was interviewed in VR, mm -hmm. and he said, it's very weird. It's all one take. There's no <laughs> editing. Because <Yeah. laughs> editing is very awkward. That's right. And it's just you know that world, and that's it, folks. Yeah, it's so funny. My wife is a filmmaker. Uh huh. So, so you just got to be frustrated by this. You can't edit. Well, it's definitely a, a problem uh -huh. for for a, a linear film. Uh huh. Um, you know, it's funny. There's a there's a really good ten part series on Netflix called The Story of Film, huh. which uh, is a ten part series that takes you through decade by decade. Oh, neat. Sort of like understanding what you're supposed to do with a camera. Uh -huh. And the funny part is the first 10 years, they took theater, which they knew. Mm -hmm. Theater was like a known right. medium. Right. And they just put a camera in front of it. Mm -hmm. And there was no close-ups. There was no editing. There was no, like... And then the first editing, they have the guy jumping out of the window on, from the right side. And then in the next cut, he's coming in from the left side. Mm -hmm. And they did this for like five years. Right. And it's funny because even in retrospect, all of this stuff looks obvious. Mm -hmm. But sitting when you have a new one on your hands, you have no idea how you're supposed to tell a story. Right. And it, it, if film is a good analog, it took us about 30 years yeah. to actually get something that was, that was designed for the language of film and not designed for the language of a stage. And I think that some process probably accelerated is going to be happening with this stuff. Well, you have the huge acceleration of YouTube and people making videos now with enormous sophistication increasingly. So they're presumably going to bring all that body of experience and excitement and youthfulness and all the rest of it to this medium yep. and make it wild and crazy. Yeah. We're watching with live right now the ingenuity. We have, this, we have this map called Live Map. You can actually see it. We released it at facebook.com slash live map. It's a map of the Earth. And there's these little blue dots everywhere. And the, the dots are larger if it's a, like, if it's a widely viewed um, live cast. Mm -hmm. And everything on there is happening right now. Hmm. Uh, and so if, you, if it, something happens in the world, you can literally just go watch and see the people that are doing little public live streams from that event. Mm -hmm. It is insanely cool. You have this emergent phenomenon of like wannabe d DJs and mm -hmm. musicians and producers in Minnesota, in Detroit, in New Jersey, just like having their little phone there on a, on a stand and making their music. Mm -hmm. And it's them and their friends. Um, and then you have the president and his social media team like figuring out how to take people behind the scenes of a cabinet meeting. Mm. Um, this stuff to me is just the, the funnest thing to be a part of is um, watching people invent their own ways to, you, go. Yeah. you know. And being able to provide a lab in, in a a device through Facebook where they can do that kind of thing. One other VR question I have is the audio. Would it be the case that when I'm looking around Grand Central that, I mean, or hearing yeah. is sort of directional, that I hear more of what I'm looking at? Yeah, we actually just brought on a team who is one of the industry leaders on 3D, 360 audio. Neat. Which is what you want. You know, you want to have the audio sphere. It's amazing how attuned you are. If it's not working, you'll notice it right away. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something we're working on as well. And the whole business of Foley will presumably come up before you're you know, bringing up footsteps or whatever the hell it may yeah. be. That, you know, making the action that much more live to people. Yeah. Plus music, plus who knows. Um, we're heading toward the uh, end of our wonderful hour. Uh, say a little bit about 
what's going on with education for you guys? Oh yeah, so <clears throat> we have a small team who's partnered with Summit Schools. Have you guys heard of personalized learning? So there's a movement in um, education reform towards a model of a classroom where students are directing their own learning and can move along at their own pace. And in the classroom, they're working on projects and with each other, and then at home, they're learning the rote material using videos and online materials. Um, a lot of the best minds in education think that this is the future because it's not using the factory model of teaching, which is hundreds of years old where you have someone lecturing, mm -hmm. but is instead using a model where the person, the student, is much more engaged in what they're doing and why they're doing it, um, and they're cho making a lot more decisions of what they're gonna work on, and then they're using the internet and other online resources, just like adults do, to figure out how to answer their questions. Mm -hmm. So we, we discovered this school called Summit, which outperformed uh, almost every other ch uh, public charter school we could find. Nine schools in the West Coast run by a woman named Diane Tavener, fantastic, who was using this software all day long. The students are using it. They, you can see, like, here's your whole seventh grade. Here's what you have to do in English. Here's how you're doing. Mm -hmm. Here's where your goals are. Here's what eighth grade looks like. And you can, you know, the vision is you can just say, I want to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. And it'll say, cool, here's, here's what you need to do to get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here are the benchmarks along the way. And, you know, maybe a seventh grader could decide that. Mm -hmm. And rather than just having this little near-term thing of you need to get an A, mm -hmm. all of this stuff is connected to long-term goals. Anyway, we have a small team that's built the software that's now about to power um, 130 public schools across the US, from Chicago to Baltimore, hmm. um, students using um, a self-directed learning experience that we've built basically for Summit. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a Facebook experience. You're not logged into Facebook. It's not about posting photos and commenting. It's really not connected with Facebook, aside from we're trying to build software that everyone can use that's really good. Um, and so it's a cool project that's been very rewarding. And it, so far, it, it's going very well. Personalized learning is a really cool idea. Here, here. Yeah. Let's get some uh, questions from the audience. Um, start right here. So we have a mic down here, and then we'll go up behind you, and then over here. Chris, my name is Chris Gates, and I'm from New York City, and I get to walk through Grand Central Station all the time. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here, and I'm thinking, like, um, you're contributing so much to us. And for those of us who are outside of the 150 people that you can manage without your head exploding, how can we contribute to you? Because the sense I'm getting is that if you win and Facebook wins, we all win. So what can those of us who are 151 and up do for you? It's funny. The, the, most, the most rewarding part of our days is when somebody uses Facebook to do something that is really awesome socially. Like a journalist does a new form of reporting and takes people with them as they're going on a memorial service. I just saw this one. This guy, I saw, I was looking at this live map. There's a little blip in Baghdad, and I'm like, oh, I have to see what's going on here. Now we've seen so much reporting from what's going on in Baghdad, but here's a guy just taking his phone around. Um, it was a memorial service for a cleric, which wasn't you know, it wasn't going to be headline news, mm -hmm. but for this guy, it was super important. And you got to follow him through the streets at night. The music, mm -hmm. you could hear the people, the vendors. You could see how it was lit. Mm -hmm. You could see, it was amazing. Um, and so for us, when people are just like try things out mm -hmm. and take risks with like, I'm going to try this out. I've never done this before, but I'm going to try it. If it's a musician, if it's a, if it's a, a parent, um, a lot of the uh, main use cases for the large groups are parenting. We're finding all these parents finally find a support network. Mm. Um, it's that. So I mean, just think of the think of the most interesting thing you didn't you haven't tried yet, and give it a shot. And if if it, something amazing happens, we'll learn from it and do what we can to help spread it. You're here, back there. Hi, I'm Sergey Koshman from Ukraine. So <clears throat> I have a more radical example of the social implications that Facebook has. As you know, we are at war with Russia, although undeclared. And Russian is, Russians are very <clears throat> competent in cyber warfare at the moment. 
And we have uh, like Ukrainian opinion leaders that have hundreds of thousands of followers on Facebook. And once Russians start like informational escalation, they have thousands of trolls, cyber soldiers on salary. So once Ukrainian opinion leaders start to share their ideas and views, they immediately get banned. Mm. And my question is, do you have any like moral dilemmas? Because it is easy to, easy to manipulate this kind of technical technically. And I don't think the people are competent enough to understand the complexity of the situation to make a decision whether this is a hatred or whether this is post has to be banned. Yeah. So how it happens? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, it's a weight we feel immensely. And when you hear that something's not working like that, it's really heavy. It weighs upon us very heavily, to put it to say the least. Um, the strategy we're taking especially with stuff that's very regional and sensitive culturally, is to get as many people as we can on the ground that we trust to help us navigate the intricacies hmm. um, and then help us inform both the technical decisions we make, what exactly happens when an account gets reported in Ukraine. You know, what exactly is the flow? Um, so in some cases, we'll be able to observe if somebody is a, is a chronic reporter, that's a flag. You know, if somebody has a network that looks like this, that might be a flag. Um, to help us try and discern what, how do we handle the situation. Um, the other thing we're do, we'll do is we'll have operations, community operations teams, they're called, that have, are trained to be sensitive to each region or each country or each language center with the, with the attempt and hope that we can get to a, a, an equilibrium that makes sense. What's your name? I like that you have people on the ground. That, that's a... Another version of reality basing that is pretty handy in the question yeah. right here. My name is Margaret. My name is Margaret Colley, and I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. And um, Facebook recently opened an office in South Africa just a few months ago. I'd like to know why it took that long. And <laughs> <laughs> a huge mistake. <laughs> and um, also, what are some of the products that you're looking at to solve some of the unique problems that there are in Africa? Yeah. Um, we just, we're seeing a huge amount of adoption um, in, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Nigeria. There's a huge amount of growth. Um, we've started doing developer conferences. Um, the most recent one we hosted was in uh, Nairobi to invite African developers to come and build a relationship with uh, the Facebook team, the Facebook platform team, so that we can support application development. There's a huge ecosystem of app developers, as I'm sure you know. Um, starting to come out of East Africa, especially. And um, we're, we're, we're like really trying to build that community out so that we have a strong connection to the technical community um, there. And then we're starting to open more and more offices there. And we're, we're trying to do a good job of getting, uh, as much as we can, um, African um, emigrants to be a part, as, to the extent we're still in Menlo Park and London and places like that, um, to be on our development team and platforms team and stuff like that. Here comes the next billion. Yeah. Thank you for doing Thanks, this. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you for done. Really appreciate it. It's an honor.